All right. Well, hey, it's great to see you this morning. Thanks for being here. Uh, this week, our, our Chi Alpha students, our group of them, there's about 40 of them that are on mission trips this week. So it's really exciting. We have a team in Turkey. Okay, so that's amazing. There's missionaries we support there, and they've joined them this week uh, just to partner with, uh, with what they're doing. There's also a team in the Netherlands. We also support a missionary there that they're partnering with. And then there's a team in Denver and a team going to Chicago tonight. So I'm so excited about what God is doing by sending our people out to the ends of the earth uh, to bring the gospel. So it's exciting. I'm excited to hear uh, just what God does next week when they get back. So I'm excited to hear about that. But today we're going to continue our Gospel of Mark sermon series. And we're in part 53 today. So I think we have about six weeks left. So we've been in this for a long time and we're kind of starting to accelerate to a close here. So I'm excited to see what God has for us as we finish up the book. And today we'll be in verse 53 of chapter 14. And for the last few weeks of the series, we've been in the final hours of Jesus' life. He shares a final meal with his disciples, and then he has a final time of prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, or just before being uh, betrayed by Judas. And, and last week we looked at that betrayal, and it was interesting. Jesus didn't feel a need to defend himself. He didn't feel a need to uh, to fight them, but instead he willingly gave himself over to the authorities because he trusted his father. And, and by looking at that, we saw that God calls us uh, not to be defensive, but to surrender to him and to love our enemies. That was a pretty challenging message. But today we're going to see that Jesus is taken to the home of the high priest, and he's going to stand trial before the Sanhedrin, which is the Jewish governing body. And, and this was actually a a buffer organization between the Jews and the Romans. Okay, so the Roman government occupied Israel at this time. So, so they kind of had this Jewish body that didn't really have any power or say, but they got to make recommendations to the Romans. So uh, Jesus is actually going to stay in two trials. We're going to see the first trial this week and then the next trial uh, next week. And this one here is before uh, the Jewish authorities and the next week the ones before the Romans. And this trial is to determine if the Jewish people have good reason to recommend his crucifixion to the Romans. And the Jewish people, they didn't have, or the Jewish ruling body, they didn't have the right to enforce capital punishment under Roman law, which is why they will need to take him to the Roman governor, or the Roman governor next week, okay? So nearly every detail of this trial, it's interesting, every detail of the trial violates the Jewish law of what's supposed to happen in, in capital cases. It's clear that the that the Sanhedrin, they're short-circuiting their own rules so that they could get Jesus' execution done quickly. There's gross injustice happening here, and I want to take a look at it. So let's see. It says this in verse 53. It says, And they led Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together, and Peter had followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he was sitting with the guards and warming himself at the fire. And now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. And for many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. And yet even about this, their testimony did not agree. And the high priest tore his garments and said, or said, what further witnesses do we need? You have heard this blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and to strike him, saying to him, prophesy. And the guards received him with blows. And as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came and seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, you also were with the Nazarene Jesus. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you mean. And he went into the gateway, and the rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him and began again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But once again he denied it. And after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. And immediately the rooster crowed a second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. All right, the sermon title is Testify. 
testify. All right, let's pray over this. Jesus, we thank you so much for this morning. And God, we thank you for every heart that's here. And God, I pray that you would speak through this word. I pray that these would not be my own words, but they would be the Spirit speaking through me. And Lord, I pray that this would not just be like lofty words of wisdom or good ideas, but it would be a demonstration of your Spirit's power. So Holy Spirit, we invite you to move and to have your way in this place. We love you, and we're so grateful to gather today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. All right, so as most of you know, Emily and I have three kids, Jane, Abram, and Caleb, and they're all four and under, so it's pretty chaotic at our house. If I don't answer the phone at night, that's the reason why, okay? Our, our, I'm kidding. Our, you guys can laugh. It's all right. I thought that was going to hit better, but anyways, our daughter Jane is our oldest, and one thing that she struggles with, and maybe you've experienced this with your four-year-old, if you ever had a four-year-old daughter, is she struggles with just never wanting to eat her food, never wanting to eat her dinner or lunch. She only wants snacks. That's all she wants to eat. It's fruit snacks, yogurt, applesauce, crackers, those kinds of things. And one Saturday last summer, she didn't eat her lunch, and then we put her down for a nap, and her and her brother Abram, they share a room, and and they typically have a pretty good time together in there. It takes them like an hour and a half to calm down and go to sleep. So after about 25 minutes, I noticed that it's pretty quiet in there. I'm like, what's going on? Did they like fall asleep? Did the Holy Spirit just come over them and bring them to sleep? And I go to check in. I'm excited to see them sleeping in there. And I open the door, and then Jane starts just kind of scuffling in her bed, and she's hiding something. I'm like, okay, what's going on? And I look at Abram. He's got chocolate all over his face. So I'm like, okay, what's happening? And I find Oreo shoved under her pillow. She had went downstairs. I... It was funny, I went downstairs after this to check it out, and she had went downstairs, she had, had climbed up on a chair and opened the snack cupboard, grabbed the Oreos out, brought them up and, or to have a snack, and then thought her brother needed some too, so she gave her brother, which is great, I think that's admirable that she would share with him, but, <laughs> but it was funny, she left the snack cupboard door open, she had the chair still sitting there, didn't try to cover her tracks at all, but then when I caught her, she's freaking out, and I said, Jane, did you go downstairs and take those cookies? She says, I don't know, I don't know, and then finally, <laughs> I got her to admit that she had had taken the cookies and had to have a conversation with her about that. But, but Jane's story, it shows us that it can be hard to tell the truth sometimes, especially if telling the truth will cost you something. It can be hard to admit that you've done something wrong. It can be difficult to share what you believe and to face rejection from other people. It can be hard to speak difficult truths to those you love. Telling the truth can be tough. And just before Jesus left the earth, he gave the disciples the great commission to go and to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them how to follow him. But he said, before you do that, go and wait in Jerusalem until you're clothed with power from on high so that you can be my witnesses. It says this in Acts 1.8. It says, but you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Okay, so for those of us who follow Jesus... Uh, there's a mandate on our lives to bear witness, to be Jesus' witness to the world. We're called to testify and to tell the world the truth about Jesus. And the truth is this, the truth is this it's that Jesus is king. It's the good news that Jesus is Lord. He has overthrown sin and evil by living the perfect life, dying for our sins and rising from the grave. Jesus has made it possible for us to have peace with God. If we trust him as the king of our lives, we can be saved. This is the gospel, or in the Greek, the euangelion. It's the good news that Mark has been telling us about. It's our responsibility to get the euangelion out to as many people as possible. Okay, but here's the thing. While this is great news, it can be difficult to share it because some react to it with hostility and anger as it demands a response from them. It calls for people to go from being the Lord of their own lives to making Jesus their Lord, and this can be a big ask, right, to ask people, hey, change your entire life and follow this man who lived in the first century. And for these disciples in Acts 1, they received the power that they needed to go and testify to the world, and they saw the church spread throughout the whole known world at the time. However, they paid a great price for telling the truth. In fact, many of them paid the price of their very lives for preaching the gospel about Jesus. Okay, so the question I want to look at this morning is, are you willing to tell the truth about Jesus no matter the cost? Are you willing to testify on Jesus' behalf, even if it's going to cost you something? Our passage this morning shows us the importance of telling the truth about Jesus. Okay, so Mark, or what he's doing is he's contrasting Peter's failure to tell the truth about Jesus with Jesus' commitment to tell the truth no matter the cost. He's contrasting those things. And to do that, Mark is actually using, once again, a technique called sandwiching, 
Okay, so where he puts one story in the middle of another to get a point across. And, and the idea is that the story on either ends brings meaning to the story in the middle. Okay, so we see that, that Peter's denial, it sandwiches Jesus' uh, truth-telling. Okay, so at the beginning we see he's following at a distance, he's kind of hiding, and then we see Jesus' trial, and then we see Peter deny Jesus three times. There's a sandwiching happening here. And I think this contrast can actually tell us a lot how to be faithful for Jesus in 2023. Our story starts by telling us that Jesus was led to the high priest, and then in verse 54, this is really important, it notes that, that Peter follows him at a distance. Peter followed, or followed Jesus at a distance, and this is interesting. Peter had just gotten done in the passage before hacking off someone's ear for Jesus. Okay, he cut the dude's ear off, and now he's, he's lurking in the shadows. He, He's following at a distance. He appears to be a bit more reserved in his defense of Jesus. He seems to be backing down a little bit. And this is such a contrast with, or with who we know Peter to be. Just in verse 31, he had said this to Jesus before Jesus was betrayed. He said, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. Okay, and now he's awkwardly trying to hang out with the guards. He's like hanging out with them by the fire. Like the guys who just arrested Jesus, he's, he's trying to blend in. What a turn of events. I think many of us are like Peter. At some point, we make a decision to follow Jesus. We tell him, hey, I'm committed to you. There's no turning back, no turning back. I'm following you. We put our trust in him. We say that he is Lord. But then when things get difficult, we start to distance ourselves from him. And we start to keep him at arm's length. We want forgiveness, but we don't want to actually follow him. Okay, we tend to follow Jesus at a distance. For example, we like the idea of following Jesus when it comes to forgiving, or when it comes to him uh, forgiving us of our sins, but we struggle with following him when he calls us to forgive other people's sins. Can I get an amen, somebody? Come on, we're about to have church, right? Okay, forgive me, Jesus. I'm really sorry, but I can't forgive the person who hurt me. Like, we like the idea of following Jesus when it comes to experiencing his life and presence, but, but then we struggle with the idea of finding life by denying ourselves and following Jesus, right? We struggle when, when, it, or when Jesus calls us to deny ourselves. And we like the idea of following Jesus when we can do it anonymously, but then when he calls us to go public with our faith, then we kind of back down a little bit. We're like, I don't know about that, Jesus. I don't want my coworkers to, or to know that I'm a Christian. You know, what might they think about me if, if they knew that? God, I don't want my family to know that I'm following you. What would they think of me? We, we struggle when we actually need to go public with our faith. Okay, we have a tendency to keep Jesus at arm's distance, especially when following him closely might cost us something. And the problem, is that, the problem with this is when we follow him at a distance, we're denying him to the world. If we're denying him. We're telling him that, you know, that we don't actually believe that the things that he said were true and the things that he claims to have done or the writers of the Bible claim that he has done, we don't actually believe those things are true. When we follow Jesus at a distance, we deny him to the world. Okay, think about this. Jesus, he, he came to the world. He said he's the son of God. He died on a cross. He goes in a grave and he comes back up out of it. In the Bible, the Bible that we say we believe in, it says that he went into a grave and came back up out of it. He rose from the dead. If we truly think that the things that he said were true, then, then don't you think we should live differently? Don't you think we should follow him closely and do what he says? Shouldn't believing in Jesus change something about our lives? Shouldn't it cause us to forgive the unforgivable? Shouldn't it cause us to deny ourselves because by denying ourselves and making room for him, we find life? And shouldn't it cause us to speak the truth even when it's hard? Shouldn't Jesus cause our priorities to be rearranged? Jesus is either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. He's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. When we try to keep him at arm's length, we tell the world we don't actually believe that he is who he says he is. And we're telling, we're telling the world we may think he's a, you know, a good teacher, or a sacrifice for our sins so we can get into heaven, but we don't actually think he's king. We don't actually think he's the Lord of the universe. I can't help but think that part of the reason why the church has lost ground in America in these last few decades is we made following him so easy. And we've said, you can follow Jesus at a distance, that's cool. And we've taken the cost out of discipleship. We've taken the discipleship out of Christianity. And then when the world looks at Christians and sees that 
or sees that we're no different from them, they aren't compelled by that. Why would they be compelled by that if we're exactly the same as them? Instead, we need to give the world a reason to be compelled by Jesus. Our lives need to be so holy and loving and beautiful that the world demands to know why we're so different. And they want to know about Jesus. And one of the ways we can do this, one of the ways we can take a step towards not just following him at a distance, but following him closely is by getting baptized in water. Okay, so baptism is a way to publicly declare that you're with Jesus. It's not something you do once you figure everything out. It's not something you do once you behave perfectly. But instead, it's something you do to simply tell the world, I'm with Christ. I'm not going back. He's my Lord. He's forgiven me. And I want to live for him. As you plunge into the waters, you're committing to go all in with Jesus. This is what baptism is. In the first century, when the first followers of Jesus were baptized, it could get them killed. And this is what made it so powerful. And what makes it so powerful in so many parts of the world today, it's a way to say, I'm for real no matter the cost. It's a way to symbolize that you've died with Christ and you've been raised with him. It's a public declaration of, it, of an inward reality. In just a few weeks, we talked about this during announcements, we have an opportunity to be baptized on Easter Sunday. If you haven't been baptized yet and you're a follower of Jesus, it's time. If you're looking for a sign, this is your sign. Jesus told you to get baptized if you follow him. Like, this is your sign. Okay, growing up in the church, I really struggled with wanting to follow Jesus at a distance. I kind of wanted to have Jesus and have the world at the same time. Like, hey, is there a way that I can figure this out? Like, like come up with a life hack where I can like get forgiveness of sins, go to heaven when I die, experience his life and presence, but then do whatever I want? I tried to figure that out. It didn't work out for me, right? Instead of being able to have it both ways or have the best of both worlds, instead what happened was I was torn up on the inside because I knew I was a hypocrite, right? I was claiming to follow Jesus, but I wasn't actually living like him. I was claiming to follow Jesus and, and to have received forgiveness, but I wasn't living as someone who actually encountered his forgiveness. It wasn't until I truly went all in with Jesus after high school that, that he began to, or to truly bring me into the life that he had destined me for. <laughs> Trying to follow Jesus at a distance, it won't work for you. It doesn't work. You can't hide with the guards by the fire. It doesn't work. It will lead to turmoil. You're either in or you're out. You need to decide, is he, is he Lord of all or is he not Lord at all? You need to decide that. Is he your Lord? If he's your Lord, that means he's your master. He's your king. You need to decide that. And this isn't something you do to try to measure up to God. Instead, it's a response to his love. If he truly gave up his life on the cross for you, doesn't it demand a response of complete love back to him? It's a response. And this is the decision that Peter needed to make. He needed to decide, am I with Jesus or not? And while he was trying to blend in and play it safe, the council was over here trying to find a legal justification for killing Jesus. And, and things were starting to get very real. And people were bearing false witness about Jesus. And surely Peter's starting to think I could be next. As for Jesus, he knew that their claims were ridiculous. And he didn't even try to defend himself. And, and this seems to annoy the high priest here. Okay, he desperately wanted to trap Jesus into incriminating himself. It says this in verse 60. It says, and the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, have you no answer to make? What is that, or what is it that these men testify against you? But he remained silent and made no answer. He said, Jesus, he was so confident in his father that he didn't need or feel the need to fire back or to defend himself. He just trusted himself to the father. And actually he fulfills an Old Testament prophecy here by being silent. It says this in Isaiah 53. It says he was oppressed and he was afflicted, and yet he opened not his mouth. And like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. So Jesus here, he's fulfilling prophecy by being silent. This is beautiful. But the high priest, he's not going to have it. He, he pushes him a bit more in the back half of verse 61. It says, are you the Christ or the Messiah, the King of the Jews, the son of the blessed or the son of God. Are you the Messiah, the son of God? He's coming out and asking it now. He's just coming right out and saying it. Up until this point, Jesus, he would silence all proclamations of his divinity. He would try to get people to be quiet about it. And Mark's readers, we have known from the beginning of the gospel that he's the Messiah and the son of God, because Mark told us in verse one, 
right? But, but now this is the first time that it's, it's going public to the people in the story. It says this in verse 62, Jesus replies, he says, I am. He says, I am. That's a big deal right there, just that little phrase, I am. That's the name of God in the Old Testament. Okay, so Jesus, this man from Nazareth, he's saying, I'm equal with God. All right, this is a big deal, and he's doing it in front of the high priest. And then he goes further. He's like, I'm going to come at you a little bit more and tell you a little bit more about who I am. He says this, this is funny, he just throws this in there. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Man, Jesus is confident. He's bold. He's like, I'm coming on the clouds, and I'll be sitting at the right hand of the Father. Okay, Jesus here, he's quoting from Psalm 110 and from Daniel chapter 7 to clearly affirm his divinity and to put himself in God's place. He will sit, on, or sit at God's right hand, and he will rule the world. He's saying, I will be vindicated by God himself to be the divine king that the Old Testament prophets prophesied about. At this point, the cat's out of the bag. Okay, Jesus gave the high priest what he needed. The high priest could now recommend his crucifixion to the Romans. And here's the thing, while the Romans, they didn't care about the Jewish law at all, really. They did balk at anyone who claimed to be king. There's only one king, his name is Caesar. Right, we talked about how they would call Caesar the son of God. There's one king, it's Caesar. And if Jesus posed a threat to Caesar, they would certainly have to kill him. Jesus' faithfulness here is astounding. Okay, we saw in the garden that he was overwhelmed at the thought of absorbing the judgment for sin on himself. He was terrified at this fact, and yet he would not deny the truth to save his own skin. And not just that, he wouldn't get defensive at false accusations. Instead, he refused to react or to lie. He simply spoke truth and trusted God to vindicate him. Okay, Jesus, he confidently testified to the truth. A chapter ago, in Mark 13, Jesus told his disciples that they would have to do the same thing. They would have to bear witness to the truth at great cost to themselves. And he told them not to fear, but to simply be faithful and to speak what the Holy Spirit gives them. He said this in verse 9. He said, but be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils, and you'll be beaten in, in synagogues, and you'll stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear, or to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but instead say whatever is given to you in that hour, for it's not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. Okay, so Jesus, he's modeling the, how to do this here. He's modeling it. He was, just delivered over, or he was just delivered over to the council. He was going to be beaten, and he bore witness. Well, he didn't shrink back, but he told the truth. He told the truth because the gospel needs to get out to the nations. As he said in verse 10 of chapter 13, Jesus was on mission to save the world, and he would not back down for personal gain. Jesus was setting an example for his disciples. He was modeling how not to be anxious before rulers, but to confidently speak the truth and tell people what the Spirit has to say. And the disciples, they would need his example as they faced similar situations all throughout the book of Acts. They confidently spoke the truth to the greatest rulers of the world at that time in the midst of great pressure. I can't help but wonder if Peter, when he would do that later on in the book of Acts, if he would look back on this example and see how Jesus did it as a way, or as a model to show him how to do it. Okay, so Peter, he would get it right later on in life. That's what's beautiful. He would stand up to the authorities and speak truth, but he does totally miss his opportunity here. He totally misses it. And Mark seems to put Peter's story of shrinking back around Jesus' story of telling the truth to show us the contrast. In verses 66 uh, through 72, we see uh, that Peter fulfilled, or fulfilled Jesus' prophecy that he would deny him three times. It's really painful to read it. You know, as, as we've been on a journey over the last year and a half, going through this gospel, seeing Peter's growth, seeing his bold proclamations of, I'm going to follow you to the end, I'll die for you. It's pretty painful to watch this. He passes out in the garden. He's taking a nap when Jesus says, I need you to pray. He's sweating drops of blood. I, I, I need you to pray. And he, and he doesn't do it. He, he, he passes out. He wakes up. He cuts off a dude's ear when Jesus said, turn the other cheek. Now he's cutting off a dude's ear. And then he follows at a distance, uh, trying to blend him with the guards, you know, being all sneaky. And now he's outwardly, he's outrightly denying Jesus. 
He's emphatically doing so to save his own skin. It's, it's painful to read. His, his spirit indeed was willing, but his flesh was weak. He was unable to stand for Jesus when it counted the most. He didn't just deny Jesus by following him at a distance at the beginning of the passage, but now he's denying him with his words. He, he denied the truth to protect himself. And I think we've all done this. Or when we're under pressure, we fail to testify for Jesus with our words. We fail to stand with him and to share about him with people who desperately need to hear about him. Just like Peter, we tend to deny the truth to protect ourselves. I think we've all failed to share the gospel with someone who needed to hear it. We failed to be the witnesses that Jesus has asked us to be. Okay, so what is Mark trying to teach us here? He, he's obviously giving us this contrast on, on purpose. What's he trying to teach us? Well, something you need to know, and we talked about this way back at the, at the beginning of the gospel, is Mark is, is writing to the persecuted church in Rome. They were being killed for their faith. They were being, being tortured and beaten for their faith. Okay, this is who he's or this is who he's writing to. They had to follow Jesus at great personal risk to themselves, and many of them died for the truth. Okay, what is Mark doing? He's calling them to be faithful under pressure. He's saying, don't follow Jesus at a distance. Don't fail to testify on his behalf when it counts. Stand your ground. Be a bold witness. He wants us to see Peter as a warning and Jesus as a model. We're called to testify for Jesus no matter the consequence. That's what he wants us to get. We're called to testify for Jesus no matter the consequence. We're called to tell the world the truth about Jesus with our words and our lifestyle, both of those things, right? We're supposed to do both of those things. We're not called to keep him at a distance and to have one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom. Instead, we're called to live just like Jesus as a testimony to who he is. We're called to live lives that demand an explanation. And we're not called to shrink back when given the opportunity to share Jesus. Instead, we're called to speak truth and love. We're called to tell anyone and everyone who will listen about Jesus and his love for them. We're called to risk rejection. We're called to risk people saying no to Jesus. He is worth it. Although the uh, disciples, they fail to testify for Jesus here, they would get it right. Like I said, in the book of Acts, we see that they, they get it right over and over again. Throughout the book of Acts, we read about their courage to tell the truth in the midst of great opposition. They were constantly told to stop sharing about Jesus and, and told to be quiet about him. Acts 4 tells us about a time where this happens. They're arrested, they're told to be quiet, and they say this. It says, so they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John, so Peter's one of them, answered them and said, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than, rather than to God you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Okay, this time, Peter got it right. He told the truth. He's just like his Lord at this point. He would not stop telling the truth. He was so undone by Jesus' love that he couldn't help but tell the world about him. He remembered the words of Jesus in Mark 13, that the gospel must be proclaimed to all the nations, and he was unwilling to shut up. It didn't matter what they did to him. He was going to tell the truth. The world needed to hear about Jesus. Okay, so with that in mind, let me ask you again. Are you willing to tell the truth about Jesus no matter the cost? Are you willing to testify on his behalf to a world that needs to hear that testimony? Okay, this is a matter of life and death. People are headed to hell, and the only way they can be rescued is Jesus. People must repent of their sins and turn to the Messiah. That's the way they're saved. In order to turn to Jesus, they have to know that he's waiting for them to turn to him. They must know that he has come and he has died. He's paid the price of sin. He has shed his blood to make us right with God. And he went into the grave and he came back up out of it, declaring death, sin, hell, and the grave defeated once and for all. They need to know this. The world needs us to speak this to them. It says this in Romans chapter 10. This is Paul. He says, how then will they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? Right? We need preachers to rise up and to share the gospel with the world that needs to hear it. The Cedar Valley, they need us to be on fire for Jesus. They, 
Guys, our world depends on it. Their eternities depends on us actually living this faith out and not just trying to follow Jesus at a distance. The world needs us to live like Jesus, and they need us to tell the truth about him. They need us to testify no matter the cost, and they need us to stop living in fear and start risking rejection and looking foolish. Uh, This last week I was reading Acts chapter 8, and it cut me to the heart. It tells the story of what happened after the first church in Jerusalem was persecuted and they scattered, they had to scatter throughout the Roman Empire or start to scatter. And I was reading from the New Living Translation, which is uh, the version I'm gonna use. It says this in Acts 8, 4. So they're persecuted, they scatter. It says this, but the believers who were scattered preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. Wherever they went. Okay, so Luke, he tells us that, that at a time when they were under pressure, they were being persecuted, they preached wherever they went. They couldn't help but speak about Jesus. And Philip the evangelist was one of the people who went around preaching, and he led a great revival in Samaria. And it says this in in verse 12, it says, but now the people believe Philip's message of good news concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ. As a result, many men and women were baptized. Okay, when I read this, my heart began to burn. i it says, many, it says many men and women were baptized. Many, right? Multitudes of people were baptized. These were people who had never, ever heard about Jesus. He's just some dude from Nazareth. They'd never heard about him. And they were willing to risk their lives by getting baptized. Right? There were, uh, these people in Samaria, they were willing to count the cost of following Jesus. The disciples, they didn't need to make it easier to follow Jesus. They simply preached the truth, and people wanted to get baptized because Jesus was compelling enough. God is looking for modern-day Phillips who will tell the world the truth about Jesus, the Messiah. He's waiting for us, sent church, to step out and to do our part. He's waiting for us to, to love him so much that we can't help but tell our friends about him. It's just an overflow, right? We love to tell our friends about the things we love, right? I've talked about Raising Cane's many times here at Sent Church. It's because I love it. I want you to experience it, if you haven't yet. If you haven't yet, I don't know what your problem is, but go after church. If you don't like it, don't tell me. It's just going to be a fist fight, so don't do it. But, uh, I'm kidding. <laughs> so here's the thing. Back to the sermon. We, we love to tell people about things we love. So if you don't want to tell anyone about Jesus, maybe you don't love him. I didn't mean to shoot you like that. I'll just sit down now. But, uh, <laughs> If we can do our part, we may just see many men and women baptized. We may see people follow Jesus no matter the cost. And this is my prayer as we're headed into Easter. And Easter is not like this one day that just saves everybody. I don't want to overhype it, right? It's, it's, it's just like every other Sunday, it's just a special day each year that, that the church comes to celebrate the resurrection. But I do think it's a unique opportunity to, to bring our friends to church as they're more open around that time. And also I'm praying that, that for those here that are part of this family that haven't been baptized yet, Get baptized. Go public. Like, like, stop trying to be by the fire. Go public. Get in the water. If you don't want to say anything, you don't have to. But just get baptized. Right? Don't let something hold you back. Or don't let something trivial hold you back from, or from obeying what Jesus told you to do. Jump in. Get baptized. I'm praying that there would be so many baptisms on that Sunday. And I pray that so many people, all of our friends who come to, to check it out, would, would just be compelled by what Jesus is doing, and that so many people would give their lives to Christ. I just want to see more people meet Jesus. I just want to see more people meet him, right? He's the, he, he's the best thing that's ever happened to me. He talks to me. He encourages my spirit when I'm down. He challenges me when I'm being an idiot. I love Jesus. He is beautiful. He's the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He, he died on our behalf, and he rose from the grave. And I just want to tell more people about him. we got to get people hearing this gospel. I believe that God is doing something significant in our days. I, I believe that in this season, people seem to be more open to Jesus, and Christians are starting to, to get hungrier for Jesus. And we need to, to truly step into what God is doing and do our part. And maybe we'll see revival come to the Cedar Valley. That's what I'm praying for. I've been praying for that for over a decade now, that that true revival would come to the Cedar Valley. I'm praying for that. Jesus is so good, and it's on us to introduce him to as many people as possible. Jesus, he calls us to testify to the world.
That's the main idea this morning. He calls us to testify. It's important to not overcomplicate this. All right, so here's the thing. You don't need to be a Bible scholar. You don't need to be an expert on all things scripture or the best communicator in the world to share about Jesus. Instead, you simply need to connect with him each day by spending time with him in the word and prayer and then ask him to give you opportunities to share. And I promise you, if you do that, he'll give you opportunities. And they'll feel somewhat natural a lot of times. It'll come up in conversation. It's not always completely natural, but it seems like a lot of times it'll just come up in conversations as you're uh, praying for the opportunities. And then as he gives you the opportunity to share and you do that, he'll do the work on the heart, right? Like you're a fool. I'm not trying to call you a fool, but I'm saying you're a fool if you think you can change someone's heart. I'm talking to myself because I've thought that a lot of times as a pastor. Like, I got to do this. I got to preach in this way. We got to have the worship. We have this volume. Like, no, we don't change hearts. The gospel and the Holy Spirit working through the gospel is what changes hearts. It's not us, right? You can say the most gibberish thing and God can use it to make sense to them and change their heart. Just be faithful and be obedient to share what he tells you to say. You don't have to overthink it. What did Jesus say? He says, don't be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but the Holy Spirit will give you the words to say. Right? But you got to open your mouth for the Holy Spirit to speak through you. Just start opening your mouth. Start sharing about Jesus. Start telling people. And here's the thing you need to know, too. You're not going to always see, like, like this dramatic salvations, right, when you share the first time. But you might get someone, if this is the faith line, you might get someone from here to here, right? You're planting seeds. And someone else might get them from here to here. And then someone else gets them from here over the faith line. And then someone else has to come along and disciple them, right? It's just doing your part, planting seeds, being faithful. It's not on us to change lives, but it's on us to simply be obedient. Okay, so I'll give you a little example from this last week. Not a crazy story by any means. Uh, but this last week, we had the window project done on the ministry center, which looks great. I'm so excited about that. You can check it out after service. But, but the guy or the salesman who was uh, just working with us from the window company, we're on the phone. And he, he told me this before, but he told me again. He said, hey, uh, me and my wife are trying to get pregnant. It's really weird. A lot of people randomly like share that with me. I don't know. It's just like a cool thing. It's an opportunity that God gives me to speak into people. Me and my wife struggled to get pregnant with our first daughter. Now he's just giving me opportunities to encourage people. This guy has not been to church at all. He never goes to church, never been to church. And I simply asked him, could I pray with you about that? He's like, yeah, that sounds great. I prayed with him. Didn't start preaching him right in that moment. Just, just prayed with him and, and said, amen. Then we talked more about windows. And it was great. We hung up. The simple, simple story of just stepping into the opportunities that God gives you, right? If someone says, I'm struggling with this, say, hey, can I pray with you? Not trying to be weird. It's not going to be all day. I just want to pray with you quick. And then invite Jesus into the situation. I think that's the best way to be an evangelist in 2023 in America is just pray with people, right? Invite the Holy Spirit into situations. And then when you're given the opportunity, share about Jesus and tell them, say, this is what he did in my life. That's all you got to do. You don't have to like, know everything about the Bible. Again, you just share, this is what he did in my life. And say, he died, he rose, and if you trust in him, he'll forgive you all of your sins. He'll, he'll give you new life, and he'll invite you into his family. That's all you got to do. Right? We so overcomplicate it. And, and guess who, who uh, tempts us to overcomplicate it? Right? The enemy. Right? He wants to make it big and scary. He wants to make it a big mountain in front of us. Oh, I can never do that. Because he doesn't want us to speak truth. He doesn't want us to invite Jesus into situations. He wants us to be silent and to be given over to fear. But today, I'm praying that God would, would set us free from that fear and help us to go and share Jesus with anyone who will listen. Okay, so how might Jesus use you to testify about him? How might he use you? Well, again, start by spending time with him. Start with that. John 15, 5. I think I'd be, re I'd be remiss not to share. This is what Jesus said. He said, I am the vine, you are the branch. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. All right, so start there. Abide because he bears fruit through you. So abide means to remain. So remain in Jesus and then let him bear fruit through you. And then as I said, just be obedient when Jesus gives you opportunities to share. And I can't emphasize enough either. It's so important just to live like Jesus. It's so important. It doesn't mean you have to be perfect, but guys, you have to actually desire holiness. It's not just about you, it's about other people. Like when you're living like the world, that's a terrible witness to them. Instead, live like Jesus. Say, I need to be a light. So when you do stumble and fall, you don't beat yourself up. You don't heap shame on yourself. Instead, you repent to trusted friends. You confess your sins and you pray for forgiveness and then you move forward. 
but Jesus needs us to actually be like him. We're called to be his disciples, right? Mathetes is the Greek word for disciple. It means to be an apprentice, right? We're supposed to apprentice under Jesus and be like him. And then as he gives us opportunities, we share the truth with whoever will hear. And for Peter, he totally failed here in Mark 14, didn't he? He totally failed. So I just wanna encourage you, if you fail, it's okay. God will give you more opportunities. What's beautiful about Peter is he fails in Mark 14. I'm about to start preaching, you ready for this? Acts chapter two, gets up on the day of Pentecost. The first sermon ever preached by the church, he preaches, 3,000 people get saved. Acts five, his shadow starts to heal people. His shadow, right? Until your shadow is healing people, you have not arrived. People are just like kind of sitting behind him like, okay, trying to get in here, get some healing. His shadow starts healing people in Acts chapter 5. In Acts 10, he paves the way for the Gentiles to join the church. He, he preaches to the Gentiles, and the Holy Spirit falls on them, and they're baptized in the Holy Spirit. And he ends up dying for his faith in Christ at the end. Peter testified for Jesus until the very end. So there's hope for you. If you feel like you have, have missed the mark, there is hope. All we got to do is follow Jesus closely, open our mouths, and love people right where they're at, and pray for those opportunities, and he will give them to us. Let's go ahead and say it all across this, and we're going to close. All right, we talked a lot about the good news this morning. We talked a lot about how Jesus, he came, and he died on behalf of our sins, and if we trust in him, we can be forgiven. And I just can't help but, but give an opportunity. If you're here today and you have yet to accept Jesus' sacrifice on your behalf and step into his family, if you have yet to receive that forgiveness and that newness of life, I want to give you a chance to do that. So if that's you, I'm going to ask you to be bold. Just slip up your hand in front of you just saying that's me so I know who I'm praying for. Is there anyone in this room who needs prayer for salvation this morning? Anyone at all? All right, go ahead and put your hands down. Let's just pray a simple prayer for, in case anyone did want to put their trust in Jesus. And if you did want to make that decision, you just pray it in your heart along with me and then, and then talk to the prayer team after church or, or talk to one of our team members. So, so just, uh, right now, Jesus, we just pray for those that, that do want to put their trust in you for the first time or recommit their lives to you. God, I pray that you'd make them a new creation, that you'd give them a fresh start, bring them out of darkness and into light. Jesus, we thank you that you are the God who saves. You came after us. You, you came out of heaven to pay our price and to rise from the dead. And for those that uh, just want to put their faith in you, God, I pray right now for newness of life and forgiveness. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. All right, one more way to respond this morning. If you're here and you're a follower of Jesus and you're saying, I want to testify. I want to testify on Jesus, on Jesus' behalf. Can you just put your hands up to heaven right now and I just pray for us all across this room? All right, let's pray that, that, that the Spirit would empower us to be His witnesses. Holy Spirit, we invite you to empower us to be your witness. Jesus, we want to testify on your behalf. We want to tell the world about you. And sometimes we get scared. Sometimes we feel like, we feel like we're not cut out for it. But God, I pray that you would, would take captive uh, those lies and fill our minds with truth and help us to go boldly and to speak your truth to anyone who will hear it. God, we love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. All right, we're going to sing one more song. The prayer team's available here, and the altars are open as always, and we'll close in about five minutes.